All right, so um, I'm going to talk about something that product managers don't normally talk about. I'm going to talk about operations. Um, I'm not going to follow the subject in that uh, is in your in the the, the schedule. Um, uh, uh, before I before I dive in, um, a lot of my talk is is it's related to WebRTC, but it's also about the bits around WebRTC, about the things that are required to run a WebRTC service. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned. Um, uh, just quick about Twilio. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, wow, we've got really bad resolution here. Um, if you're not familiar with Twilio, we provide a cloud platform for um, uh, building communications apps of all kinds, a carrier connectivity all over the world. We have um, uh, over, over 750,000 750, developers on the platform and are processing uh, more than 50 billion interactions with our API a year. Um, so I think, you know, if you've been working with WebRTC for a while, you know that um, the simple case, um, you know, it's, it's a testament to, to the strength of the WebRTC APIs that it's easy to get something simple up and running quickly. Um, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer call between two uh, instances of Chrome is, is not challenging. But um, the complexity of, web, of a WebRTC service scales um, uh, very rapidly, and it does not scale linearly. It gets, uh, you, you're introducing more variables into the equation, and more things can go wrong. Um, you know, it, it starts when you just want to talk to uh, another browser. If you want to talk to Firefox, your client needs to get thicker to deal with the differences in the WebRTC implementations. Um, if you want to have more reliable network connectivity or uh, support mobile devices, you need to introduce Turn, and you need to get WebRTC compiling for mobile apps. Um, then if you want to support multi-party, like Emil talked about, you need to introduce media servers. And uh, at that point, you'll probably also want to separate signaling from media and uh, uh, to, because they have very different scaling properties and move your, the state of your, your uh, application out into a separate service. So now we've got even more boxes running here. And then um, someone like me, a, a lousy product manager, will come along and say, well, we want to connect to SIP devices too. So you introduce a SIP gateway and, uh, and then, you know, next thing you know, you're calling PSTN phones. And, and, and at, each, at each step here, we're introducing um, more things that can and will break, um, and we're introducing them in a uh, multi-point network all over the world. Um, you know, things, things will go wrong. Networks fail, services fail, hosts fail. Um, something will break. Um, something's breaking at Twilio all the time, um, and we hope you don't know that. We hope that we've built a, a system that um, can protect uh, uh, customer applications from those failures. So. Um, we don't have perfect solutions for all of this, but I wanted to share just a handful of the tools that we've created over the, uh, over the course of running a WebRTC service for a few years now, and, uh, and hopefully they'll be useful to you. Um, things break for a bunch of reasons. You know, you've got, um, in, a, in a cloud service, um, hosts fail at random, um, uh, networks degrade, you have, you have to deal with um, people on, on the internet trying to do bad things, sending traffic to your servers that you may not expect. Um, and you, you also have human elements, things you can control, um, things like operational mis mishaps and um, just uh, inadequate testing in your code, bugs you've introduced um, because we're human beings. Um, as I mentioned, these things are happening all the time at Twilio. You know, we have tens of service failures a week. Um, something, you know, some alert is going off, something is paging, um, someone is looking into something because it is such a large network. But um, We've been able to deliver 100% uptime for the last two quarters, and we'll have 99.95% uptime for the year uh, in our WebRTC service. So the first thing and most important part of our, um, of our strategy for dealing with failure is to test constantly. Um, uh, we, uh, we have a set of uh, what we call end-to-end -end testers. If you're ever talking to a Twilion, they might even mention them. They might say uh, our EDE tests or our end-to-end -end testers. And these are a set of um, applications that are continually hammering our service like a customer would. They're, they're continually testing the, the cloud the same way the customers will. Now, we learned a few things when we, when we built these. Our first attempt was to build them using uh, the Node WebRTC project. So uh, these end-to-end -end testers, by the way, these are running on servers, running on servers either in Amazon or in another cloud, and they are um, making requests into the Twilio cloud. Um, our first approach was to use a, a server-based project like Node WebRTC um, to try to, uh, you know, act like a browser client. We found that that was just really, really difficult. It's it's hard to keep WebRTC running well um, on on a server right now. Just server-side WebRTC isn't quite uh, isn't quite there yet. Um, 
So we, what we ended up doing over time is we've actually separated, uh, separated these things. Um, we, we broke out our signaling tests from our media tests. And so we have a set of very lightweight, fast tests that are continually making sure that um, the, the signaling infrastructure is available. And, and, and that's, that's really key because the, 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 a lot of the application logic will, is, of course, living at the signaling layer. Um, uh, and so, so we have a set of uh, tests running in Node that are simple WebSocket clients of our gateway that are constantly exercising various application functionality. Then we have um, a set of robocallers, we call them. These are um, basically headless browser tests running on, um, using the latest uh, version of Chrome, using uh, Chrome Canary as well, um, and, uh, and Firefox and any other browser that comes along with WebRTC or ORTC support, um, to, to act like a browser will when it's interacting with our service. These tests run less frequently, maybe once every five minutes. Um, but they give us, uh, the, the combination of these tests give us a, a full picture of the availability of our service at any given point in time. Um, we aggregate events from these tests in a product called Rollbar. Rollbar is a, is a great tool. If you are operating any kind of service or application, I highly recommend it. Um, so we, we pull all these things into Rollbar. It gives us the ability to aggregate events, to um, look uh, very easily identify changes in event patterns, and set off pagers if necessary when things go wrong. Um, we also have a bunch of end-to-end -end manual testing tools. So here are just a handful of them, and there are others that I haven't depicted. Um, and the, the, the idea here is that automated tests don't always catch everything. Um, you, you will, as, as browsers change, as we release new versions of, of our SDKs, as uh, we make changes in the cloud, um, you, 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 sometimes you miss things. And so um, uh, we have an a infrastructure in place that um, the, minute we can, the minute we identify that something's gone wrong, we can jump into a set of tools that allow us to very quickly um, uh, exercise a very specific scenario. So for example, we want to connect to a conference mixer in the Twilio cloud, or we want to connect to a PSTN endpoint, or we want to make a call from a SIP endpoint to a WebRTC endpoint, or we want to make a call between two WebRTC endpoints. These are all scenarios that are kind of uh, baked, locked and loaded and ready to go, and so we can uh, figure out when things have gone wrong very quickly. Um, one of, the th one of the things that we've started doing more recently that I think is, is pretty cool is we're also using chat as a control plane for this. So, um, you know, we, we are using HipChat, and, uh, but this, is, this can be done in Slack as well. Um, it, we have a set of uh, very easy bots set up so that we can just issue commands in our, hip in our team's HipChat window and run a set of end-to-end -end tests against the entire cluster at a moment's notice and then get a, a report back with which tests pass passed, which tests failed. At the end of this, you, we end up with a, with a sort of a layered approach to service monitoring. So we've got end-to-end um, -end tests running at both signaling and media layers. We have an anomaly detection service that is looking for um, uh, changes in behavior and uh, generating pages or, or uh, alerts um, if anything uh, seems, uh, seems to have changed. We have your typical host monitoring tools um, through Nagios, and we have this set of manual tools that allow us to, to very quickly test. So, um, you know, there's a, there, I've already talked about how things fail, but um, you not only have to plan for things to fail, you have to plan for what happens when you recover from a failure. Um, here's what I mean. You, uh, our uh, simplified view of uh, a portion of Twilio's architecture looks like this. We have, we have, a, 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 DNS, um, uh, have a DNS name pointing to our gateways, that actually uh, does DNS distribution to a number of load balancers in a given AWS region. Behind that, we have a set of gateways um, uh, for signaling. And then further back behind that, we actually have a registrar. If you're not familiar with the concept of a registrar, this is just a database that keeps track of where users are connected right now. So if someone tries to call them, you can ring their phone. This isn't important if you're doing sort of a room-based WebRTC app, but if you want to have a um, uh, persistent connection so that you can reach someone quickly, we, like to have a phone call sort of use case, you need a registrar to keep track of where everyone is. So, you know, obviously we've built redundancy into this architecture. If, uh, if we've got a client connected to load balancer A uh, and they were routed to gateway A, if gateway A fails, well, they can uh, be redirected to gateway B. They can uh, uh, re reconnect. If, if, the, if load balancer A fails, that client can connect to load balancer B and get, and get connected to a gateway B. Um, uh, but what happens when this, w in this scenario? What if it's not just one client, but 
thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of clients connected, and you have a load balancer, um, uh, just go away, um, because that happens sometimes in the cloud. Um, well, uh, <laughs> this is first-hand experience here. What will happen is that all of these clients will start hammering load balancer A, and uh, in a way that uh, you might not have thought of. Um, this, happened, uh, this, is, this happened to us uh, a couple years ago and uh, uh, caused, a, caused some significant problems. It led us to, to think about this failure case of, okay, what happened? let's look at our peak number of connections and let's consider what would happen if all those peak connections had to move from one balancer to another or one data center to another at the drop of a hat. Would we be able to uh, handle, that, handle that shift? It ended up with us putting in uh, extensive rate limiting both on the balancers and the gateways. You also have to think about when you're under that, um, when you're recovering from that failure, what happens to your database layer? Do you, uh, how do you handle locking in your database for, uh, because you'll, you'll be getting hit with a bunch of registration requests uh, very quickly, and you have to know, um, you have to be able to make sure that your registrar can uh, write all those records down uh, without getting bogged down. Um, so next, I think, you know, we've already touched on this a bit. Um, in, uh, Fippo did a great job of talking about some of the ways uh, some, some great WebRTC apps are working around lousy networks. Um, we found that you know, as we w started using WebRTC on mobile, we needed to get um, more effective at testing in, in, uh, in poor quality networks so that we could understand uh, various trade-offs we were making. Should we use, uh, what, it, what is it like to use H.264 uh, versus VP8 on an iOS device, and how does that shift based on um, uh, you know, uh, various network conditions. Uh, is it, it, are we getting much more out of, out of hardware acceleration in a typical network environment? This is, these are just some of the questions we asked. And, and we needed a way to um, inject uh, various network conditions into, uh, into our environment and, and measure the results. Um, you, know, you can do this on one machine. Uh, uh, if you're using a Mac, uh, Apple provides a network link conditioner. You can go download this. Um, it's great if you just want to uh, do a test through the simulator. It doesn't, it doesn't scale well, though. So what we actually did was we, another, um, another node app we created. We created a, a, a node app called Network Throttler. You can go see this on GitHub if you're interested. This is just a, a Node.js service um, that, run, that basically issues commands to NetM, and it runs on a Raspberry Pi. And so we have a Wi-Fi interface on a Raspberry Pi running this um, network emulator. And we can do things like simulate a 3G network, simulate a 4G network, simulate high uh, lo loss at various levels. And uh, so we have a, a kind of a closed environment that we uh, have set up in our office in Mountain View where we can run tests uh, under various network conditions um, and, and really get a sense for how, um, how WebRTC and how our customers will experience uh, situations under typical network conditions. Um, and on that point, uh, the, the, next, the next major tool we use is WebRTC's GetStats API. Um, when we, uh, I think anyone who's, who's operated a, uh, a communication service of any kind, and a, a bunch of you in this room have done that, you know that you will always have complaints about call quality. You will always have reports of one-way audio. You will always have complaints about video call quality because networks are, uh, networks are hard <laughs> and they're not reliable. And so, um, uh, about, a, about a year ago, we started um, uh, aggressively gathering uh, statistics from GetStats uh, on uh, all of our Chrome endpoints and, uh, and Firefox as well. We, we pull the GetStats API, um, we, we uh, take the statistics we get back, we bundle them up in a standard format, and we push them to Amazon Kinesis. Um, if you're not familiar with Kinesis, it's a, a great product for um, dealing with large sets of data uh, and kind of subscribing to different data streams to process them in various ways. We pump the data out of Kinesis into some real-time monitoring tools so that we can see changes in call quality for um, various uh, customers. Um, and, and we also pump them into Redshift for, for historical reporting. So we have um, long-term reporting and real-time monitoring of call quality via the GetStats API. Um, some of the stats we capture, um, you know, we look audio input level, audio output level, all the typical things you would see in the GetStats API. I, I know this is a kind of a moving, GetStats is a moving target in all the browsers. And you have to um, you have to kind of roll your own if you're dealing with WebRTC uh, natively, but I highly encourage you to to, to take a look at this. Um, here's some of the patterns we look for. Um, you know, kind of obvious ones for for a given customer. 
we just, uh, if we see packet loss uh, drop off uh, for, for a, a customer that we know is working out of a single office location, well, we know they're probably having really bad uh, call, call quality right now. If we see uh, spikes in jitter or, or latency. Um, some of the other more complex ones, um, calls with, that are greater than five seconds but have no audio um, or have an audio uh, uh, or have um, a low audio input level. Or if we see um, calls that are set up for, you know, 30 seconds, 50 seconds, but there are no packets sent from the browser. Um, uh, these are uh, indications of one-way audio. And a good story here is um, this, we were able to use this tool to identify um, some, an, an issue, uh, I think it was in Chrome 41, there was a, a very, a very weird, I think actually uh, the fellow from Wix uh, mentioned it. It was a very, very unusual scenario where um, if you were using a, um, a USB headset on a Mac in Chrome 41, uh, and it was more likely to occur if, you were, if your app was served over HTTPS, you would have um, a frequent occurrence of one-way audio. The HTTPS thing wasn't really a factor in getting access to the microphone, but it was because you weren't um, calling get user media all the time that, uh, uh, and, and prompting the user that it was um, uh, less likely that you would uh, get, get a, a corrupted audio stream. So um, using, using some of these heuristics, we were able to identify, hey, look, we've got a pattern of uh, the number of one-way audio calls um, just increased trem tremendously based on the latest release of Chrome. Um, we should probably dive in and, and do something there. Um, we also look, we, we look at all these um, things by, ver you know, uh, by various vectors. You know, we look by Twilio account, um, by the identity of a given endpoint. What browser are they using? So we, we try to identify changes in behavior. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, operational excellence, kind of uh, building these tools, thinking about these tools, car caring about service uptime is an issue of culture. It, 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 is, a, it is a team effort. It, it, it does not come for free. Um, and so some of the things we do at Twilio to uh, kind of build this into the way we work. Um, uh, we write the SLA, or we try to at least, we don't always get this right, but we try to write the SLA uh, first. When we're designing a new product or service, we start with the service level we want to deliver to our customers. Um, when I started at Twilio, there was an old saying, write the API first. That came from our roots as an API com company. And we've modified that over time to not only write the API, API first, but write the service level first as well. Um, we also have a culture where the teams that build a service operate that service in production. There is no ops team. We have, we have people who are in support, but uh, the people who build services operate them. So there's a, a very personal, uh, a sense of personal ownership of, of uh, uh, service quality. Um, five wise analysis, I probably don't need to talk about what that is. Um, regular fire drills, um, uh, actually uh, creating incidents either in a development environment or even uh, in a controlled way, perhaps even in a production environment and responding to, to the fire drill, making sure that you have the, the well-oiled machine so you can respond to an incident, et cetera. Um, so last thing I'll say is uh, communication tools are only as good as their availability. You know, we, we've all had that experience where we go to use a communication service. Um, we go to use a product and it, it just isn't there. Something doesn't quite work. So this is, um, this is key. Um, hopefully you find some of these tools useful. Thanks. Th thanks, Rob. That was really interesting. Why don't we uh, take some, some questions quick? Anybody? I'll, I'll look in the back first. Any, maybe maybe I'll, I'll start, Rob. Maybe, uh, maybe a simple <laughs> one. What would you say is the most common issue that you see with WebRTC? Um, I think we still see, uh, uh, right now we still see a lot of one-way audio problems um, for various reasons. Um, you know, uh, could be anything to do with uh, GTLS changes, ICE failures, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, that's probably one of the most common issues. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, come across any best practices for in injecting streams during testing? Um, no, that's something we're still working on. Uh, I think our media testing is is uh, uh, you know we're still improving, but we we have we do a set of things where we um, you know play audio through the browser and we um, try to uh, play it back, but but nothing too complicated there. Okay. What percentage of your customers using audio versus video calls? Um, almost all of our calls are audio right now. So Twilio, Twilio did not have um, a video product. We were using WebRTC since 2012. We've not had a video product in the market um, until earlier this year. So 
Um, we do a lot of WebRTC calls, but they're all audio. Right. Last one. So what tools are you using now to identify those patterns of when you see there's flaws? Is it the browser? Is it? Yeah. Um, like I said, Rollbar um, and some of our own anomaly detection tools are, are really key. Um, I, I think the key thing for identifying issues in the browser is, uh, for us, we use GetStats a lot. We use the automated tests, um, Selenium based on uh, beta channel and canary of all the uh, of each of the browsers, those are those are the key things for us. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. All right.